All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. It's so nice to see you. Uh, welcome to our final event in our fall series of What Matters to Me and Why. I'm Vanessa Gomez Brake. I serve as the Associate Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life here at USC, and we're in for a treat today as it's not often you get to hear from the university president in such an intimate setting and an intimate crowd. Before going any further, I wanna wish everyone a happy Festival of Lights. Today is the fourth day of Hanukkah, and may all your candles burn bright this season, and may we all see brighter days ahead. So, the What Matters to Me and Why Speaker Series represents a creative solution to an important problem in the university setting. It's that separation of intellectual life from the personal and the spiritual. This series offers the Trojan family an opportunity to hear from USC faculty, administrators, in a different way. Rather than lecturing on their area of expertise or research, we invite speakers to share their life journey with us. So once a month during this Wednesday lunch hour, we get to listen in as they reflect on their values, beliefs, motivations that have shaped their lives. So here we are for the final in our series. Um, I would love to invite you to nominate a member of our Trojan family to speak at a future event, and you can do that via our website. Everyone is nominated, even the president was nominated. Um, <laughs> because we all want to hear from her. Um, but you can also visit our website to see past um, speaker events. We had an amazing lineup this, uh, this fall semester from Jonathan Wing at APAS, as well as Dr. Molina, um, MacArthur Fellow, and so um, just some life stories worth visiting. So before uh, I begin our main program, I wanna tell you just a bit about what to expect in spring. So um, we've got great news. We're actually collaborating with the University Club next semester, and we're gonna feed you all lunch. Yes, lunch, socially distanced. Um, and so we're gonna take you to the club um, and do it upright. And so for the series, uh, the first Wednesday of every month, we're gonna have Dean Emily Roxworthy. She's the new Dean of the School of Dramatic Arts, so you'll get to meet her. Next up, we have Viet Thanh Nguyen, Professor of English and American Studies, as well as the New York Times bestseller, as well as a Pulitzer Prize winner. I cannot wait to meet him. And then lastly, we'll hear from Christy Culpepper on April 6th. She's the Associate Director of Undergraduate Admissions and Outreach at the Marshall School of Business, as well as the current president of the USC Staff Assembly. And the student who nominated her had such a great story to share, and so I absolutely had to have her in this program. So it's an exciting lineup, along with a new venue. So um, yeah, plan to be with us next semester. And perhaps if this event isn't enough for you today, I invite you to join our chaplain intern, Annie, who's uh, visiting from the Buddhist Seminary of the West. And she's gonna do a pop-up tea ceremony along Truesdale. And so if you'd like a mindful moment, please see Annie. And it's really just a walk down Truesdale, a sip of tea, and a joyful moment. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, typically, we ask a student or a colleague to introduce our speaker, so today, I asked my boss, <laughs> and that is Dean Varun Soni. So, he will offer a few words now about President Folt. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you, Vanessa, for bringing us together today. This is my first day back from a two-month sabbatical, the first sabbatical of my career. I have a whole new appreciation for the term Sabbath. Uh, I feel well rested. Um, and so what that means is this is like my first campus event in a year and a half. I just want to take a second and honor that. Um, I don't think any of us can take this for granted today. This is a beautiful site in a beautiful space. I really miss this, so thank you all for being here. Uh, what Matters to Me and Why has been around for more than 20 years at USC. It's a cherished campus tradition, it's a signature series, it's a national program, but USC is really the gold standard because this, while this happens at other universities, we're the only university where this happens once a month. And so over the last 20 plus years, we've had some extraordinary speakers. This is a great gift that I inherited from the previous dean and something I look forward to passing on one day to my successor. 
I've always seen this series as a sacred space, a sacred moment where people can really wrestle deeply with the things that matter. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. reminds us that our lives start to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. And what I have noticed with this series is that the opportunity to discuss things that matter is as meaningful to the presenter as it is to the audience. And the question of what matters to me and why is a foundational question for understanding what it means to be human. It's the question that all of us wrestle with in our lives. The answer might change, the answer should change, but the question remains the same. The question endures, and it connects us with everyone who's ever lived across space and time. What it means to be human is to ask yourself the question, what matters to me and why? Over the course of this series at USC, we've hosted alums, professors, coaches, trustees, deans, staff members, provosts, and occasionally we get a president. And so uh, President Stephen Sample spoke here in 2002, um, and today is really a happy day for us in the life of this series. It's a very good day to be a Trojan because we welcome to what matters to me and why our beloved president, Dr. Carol Folt. Dr. Folt serves as the 12th president of the University of Southern California. She's a highly experienced leader, internationally recognized life scientist, and award-winning teacher. Formerly, she was the chancellor of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the oldest public university in the nation. She also served as interim president and provost at Dartmouth College. An Ohio native, Dr. Folt is also a, Cali a California kid. She earned her bachelor's degree in aquatic biology and master's degree in biology from the University of California at Santa Barbara, my alma mater, go, go Gauchos. Um, she also received her doctorate in ecology from the University of California, Davis. Before I started as a university administrator, I was an idealist, like many of our students. But now I'm an incrementalist. That's because universities are slow-moving places. They are multi-billion dollar enterprises with dozens of stakeholder groups. They are cities within cities. They are large and decentralized bureaucracies. And so just getting a little better every year means that you're getting better over time. As university administrators, we celebrate incremental gains as hard-fought victories because that's what they are. And that's why, given this context, I am absolutely floored, totally flabbergasted, and completely in awe of everything that President Folt has accomplished in under three years. I've been working on many of these issues for the better part of a decade, and it's dizzying to see how quickly President Folt has been able to address them. Even accomplishing one of these things would have been extraordinary, and she did it all and so much more. I just, this morning, started to think off the top of my head a few, you know, I'm a little out of practice, I've been on sabbatical, but just off the top of my head, a few things that she's accomplished that I, I never thought I would see, quite frankly, at USC. Uh, because of President Fault, we are now tuition-free for families making less than $80,000 a year. This is a big deal, people. This is what equity looks like, you know? This is what it actually looks like, not just what it sounds like. Because of President Fault, we've halted university investment in fossil fuels. We've liquidated current holdings in our investment portfolio and endowment. And we're probably the largest university in the world to do so. Because of President Fault, we have appointed USC's first chief diversity and inclusion officer. That was a 10-year process to get there. Because of her, we have uh, USC's first chief sustainability officer. Because of Pres President Fult, we've expanded the cultural centers uh, and student spaces on campus. Once again, a 10-year journey to get there. Because of her, we've increased the mental health counselors at our counseling center. We've more than doubled them. Because of President Fault, we've reimagined policing and impl implemented reforms to the Department of Public Safety. We've renamed the former VKC building after D Dr. Joseph Medicine Crow, our most illustrious alum, in my opinion, and also established scholarships for Native American students in his name. Five years ago, we didn't even have a Native American student union. We had to incubate that at the Office of Religious and Spiritual Life. So it's amazing how quickly this has moved because of her leadership. Because of President Fult, the university issued a formal apology and posthumous degrees to Japanese and Japanese American alums for the university's mistreatment of them during their internment and imprisonment in World War II. Because of President Fult, we recruited the most diverse and selective group of first-year students in USC's history. She has spoken out publicly against anti-blackness, anti-Chinese xenophobia, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia at a time when we needed it most. And I gotta say, President Fult, I gotta say, you nailed the football coach hire this week. You really did. I can't wait to see the Coliseum next, next year. And she did all this with the unprecedented challenge of physical dislocation and remote learning. She did all this while overseeing a medical center that has been on the front line of a once in a century global pandemic. And she did all this while trying to move a scandal-plagued university out of the darkness and back into the light. Whew. Heavy is the head that, heavy is the head that wears the crown and lonely too. 
Students have other students, professors have other professors, deans have other deans, coaches have other coaches, staff have other staff, parents have other parents, but the president stands alone. And in the age of constant outrage and online trolling, being a leader is really hard and totally thankless. And so, I wanna take this time to thank you, President Folt, for your extraordinary courage, for your moral leadership, for your strength of conviction, for your open heart, for always keeping our students front and center as our North Star. And today especially, I wanna thank you for accepting this invitation to speak at What Matters to Me and Why. So please join me in giving a warm Trojan welcome to our esteemed leader, the 12th President of the University of Southern California, Dr. Carol Folt. Maybe everyone should take a sabbatical. <laughs> no. no, thank you so much for inviting me. But I want to thank you, Varun, too. From the moment I came to USC, you know, I really was welcomed in a very uh, personal way by, by individuals. But one of my first, first things I did was go and visit with Rune, and he took me to meet students from the nearly 100 different spiritual organizations we have here. That was mind-blowing to me. You know, I've been at other great universities, but they don't have even remotely that type of diversity and representation, people sitting in tables next to each other that uh, cover every single aspect of spiritual life. And I was so moved by that. And so I have been um, just, since I've been here, that's a part of my understanding of the identity of students at USC that goes back to those first moments when I met there and met so many students, so many staff and faculty that came together in that home. And that's what I know that you're trying to be, Vanessa, all of you here, you're trying to do that. And I think it matters so much. And one of the things that they were saying at the start of this talk is the idea that students sometimes feel this split between your spiritual and your personal life and your professional life. And I'm gonna say one of the things that matters most to me is eliminating that split. And maybe as I talk a little bit about what matters to me, I can tell a little bit about my own journey, because that's certainly not how I emerged, but it is how I try to be now. The same person here as I am when I'm playing with my grandkids, when I'm talking to people who are angry, and when I'm talking to people who are jubilant, I try very hard to have all the pieces of my personhood <laughs> together in one place. It isn't easy, but in the end, it is so wonderful because you're not always having to fight between the different parts of your personality. You're allowing them to really uh, be moving together. So that's another thing I love about what I felt in that room at the first, when I first went with you there, and what I think this series is about. So I think it's fabulous that you're having it, and I love being able to be here and to talk to all of you. I, I was listening, of course, to all the things that uh, Rune was talking about, and. Those are things that we have put in place, but I think as you'll go back and, and I talk about what matters to me, I think you'll see those are all extremely consistent. Probably anyone that has known me in a leadership position, even going back when I was a first faculty member, would say there probably isn't anything on that list they'd be surprised about seeing on that list. And that, probably more than anything, is something I might feel good about, that I've had this, um, in fact, not just good about, extremely privileged. I've had amazing positions where the things I care deeply about have a chance to come to life. That is one of the most humbling, but one of the most uh, amazing opportunities in life. So finding your way into places that can allow you to do what you really cared about, it makes it not be so hard and maybe not even be so lonely because you have that chance, that chance of trying to bring people together. The other thing I'd say about that list is, of course, that isn't me. Those are all of us. Um, they are the people that were here that were fighting for those issues. They are the people that care about all those things in their lives, that look to us, that have these positions of privilege and, and, and um, real opportunity to actually bring voice to them. So it never works when you think that you're by yourself. It only works when you understand that it is really all of you together. So thank you for giving me that sort of thought about where we go as I think about 
what I'm going to talk to you. So I'm going to talk about three, they're big categories, and they've got many pieces. But I, it was kind of easy for me to say, what are three things, if I were to take the three things I care about most at a, in a general way, what would they be? And the first for me, I put in the category of connection to humans. And of course, that includes my family right at the center. But it is very much about how I try to walk through the world, which is to look in people's eyes, see the people that are around me, the incredible diversity of the world reflected in human connection is the most beautiful, beautiful thing that we have and that we can work with. And so I'll talk more about specific areas that you might think about that. You know, for me, that's just an issue about how does a president write emails that don't make everybody mad, you know? <laughs> trying to be human in them. I mean, there are many ways that that matters to me. And we'll talk about specifics. But it, it really starts in that point of human connection and empathy and just immense uh, astonishment at the things people say, how they feel, what they do. I mean, it's just such an amazing, rich world. The second for me is nature. You know, I have loved wild places my whole life. I, I can't see a tree that it doesn't help me feel better. I can't be around water that it doesn't sort of soothe my soul. And I grew up in Akron, Ohio, in a very suburban neighborhood, yet those places for me were enormously satisfying and fulfilling. And that love of nature, and now this is the diversity and glory across the entire planet, outside the human world to the natural world, is probably the thing that grounds me in many, many ways. And that can lead to my love of sustainability. It can lead to aspects of, of what I love about the wild places, how we try to protect and make available to students that live, to students that come from every background, opportunities to thrive in the natural world. It can lead to us fighting for our cities to get trees into neighborhoods where there is nothing but concrete. You know, it, it lives in many places, but for me that's, that's really central. And I, my third actually came pretty easily, too. It was that I, I can't tell you anything that can feel almost more exciting than the watching the power of discovery and creativity. When you're working with someone and you see them discover something, there is a light that comes in their eyes. And so if you love to teach, it's that moment when your students get it. If you love to be, if you're a scientist or you're an artist, it's that moment they're standing there in front of the canvas and something is coming to light that no one had ever seen before. It's that opportunity to see people empowered when they understand just how creative and smart they can be. And seeing that and what that capacity does for what they can start thinking to achieve, that drives probably why I love being at universities. They're, they're almost maybe nothing else that unifies it. So those three are probably my, sort of my general uh, categories. And, and I'll talk a little bit in specifics, but then I'd love to have you know, questions and answers and, and hear from all of you. So who, where did I come from? <laughs> so I came from Akron, Ohio, but you know, I came from a family that was raised largely in an immigrant tradition. My mom's family were Albanian and they were immigrants. My mom was actually born in the States, but her sister was born in Albania. And <clears throat> we lived close to that family. And I think I was really blessed to be in an immigrant family. I bet a lot of you are close to one or in one them yourselves, but there were just things and aspects of growing up in that environment that I feel have been so valuable to me. In particular, a family. That was a huge, huge part of everything, every tradition, every name day, every holiday, every everything, lots and lots of people, all that carry that that uh, feeling, but because they were separate from their country. And Albania had really been, has been, a very troubled place. My grandfather had to flee because he lost. He was on the losing side of the revolution in Albania. They developed their own communities. They brought people over. So it was very much about what do you do to strengthen and build community. And the other thing was about education, 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 education. Work hard, go to school, work hard, go to school. So I think those are wonderful things. And I think it gets a little harder to do it when you start taking it for granted. But for many people who came to America, this democracy, this all that carried such meaning, and they transferred it. So I 
feel like I was the amazing recipient of that. My dad <clears throat> was a chemist, and my mom was a chemist, too. Okay, second amazing thing to have a mother, I, of my age, a mother who was a chemist was extremely unusual. So I was kind of raised where I would get dolls, but I got weather sets. I mean, I got science stuff along with every other thing that you can imagine, and there weren't that many women of my generation that had that. That was another immense gift. I never thought <clears throat> that I had a single thing that was closed off to me. And I had many friends that did. You can't do that. You can't do this. Women don't do that. Women don't do this. I never had that. So <clears throat> that's had a huge influence on me, and it's something I wanted to make sure my daughter never felt, or my son, and my grandchildren, and all the students that I come with. But you know, these, these things that our families bring to us are important. And when they bring the opposite, I don't think that wounds you, but it might remind you that sometimes it's, it's a different path for people to get to that feeling that anything is possible. So I had that great um, luck of life. My father worked at Goodrich, and he was, he was, it turned out, an inventor. I don't know, I think he had something like 250 patents. I didn't know what that really meant. During the war, he was actually part of the effort to create um, rubber, and he was the person that invented the first man-made natural rubber. Now, as a kid, do I know any of that stuff? No, I had to figure that out later. But another amazing gift was this idea that everything was an experiment. I never got a straight answer on anything. <laughs> what do you think about this? Well, what do you think about this? You know, <clears throat> Tell me why you're arguing that. But it was that analytical thinking and that idea <clears throat> that asking questions became kind of a game. It was really fun to sort of do that. So again, I think that's something that starts early or you develop it maybe in courses that you're taking. It reinforces it, but it sets you on a path where even things like criticism aren't so painful if you see them as puzzles and ways to try to you know, address those issues and bring it forward. So in growing up, that was really important to me. I worked from the time I was a little kid, from babysitting. I had to put myself through school. And so I became a waitress. Going to say, that has a huge lot of influence, and I can serve many cups of coffee at the same time <laughs> still. But I loved being a waitress, too, because waitressing was fast. You were interacting with a lot of people. You took your money home in your pocket that night. You know, you knew where you stood. But, you know, all these things sort of compound. I also was in college during very contested times in university. Sounds familiar. Um, but it is, you know, the late 60s, early 70s when I was starting off in, at university. That was a pretty contested time. And many things have changed. So where I am is that I have been in some amazing way at the front end of almost all the change women's rights, bringing in diversity into universities. You know, all the big waves that we've seen, changes in science and technology. I've had that amazing moment to always kind of be at the cutting, the front edge of that. That is really exciting. And that's, I think, why I love all that discovery. It's the churn that happens that can be very disturbing to us, or it can be the real spark, the thing that gets us so excited. So I think I always had that, but I fell in love with the environment when I took a class at uh, UC Santa Barbara, um, which was a marine biology class. And we went out, and I know you've all probably been out there, and we followed bioluminescent organisms in the ocean, and I just, that was it. I was there. I wasn't going to want to study anything else. It just became really important for me. Before that, I thought I'd be an artist. I was an art major. I, I thought I'd be a, a scientific illustrator. I had all those ideas, but that's when I decided and became fully invested in being um, really an environmental scientist because I wanted to understand the world, the natural world, but I wanted to protect it. That was very early on for me was the idea that as humans, we couldn't separate nature from humans. We actually had to learn how to work together and nurture that as humans. And it's interesting when I think about it now, we weren't using the word sustainability. The word that we used was ecosystem science. It was the idea that all the parts of a lake, for a lake, for example, it wasn't just about the lake. It was about the groundwater. It was about the air. It was about this interconnection. And very uh, about 10 years after I got started, they developed the, whole, the word called Anthropocene, which was the idea that we have a whole new geological era 
this was a big deal at the time, and that era now includes the relationship between humans and the environment. So I was in all that. That's what I care about as a scientist. It led to virtually all the work I've done, and it's why I'm so excited about sustainability and what we can do here with that. But it also makes me impatient. I've been working on it myself for more than 35 years, and sometimes I think, how can we have worked so long on it and not be further along. So that, that, I think, leads to where I look at sustainability and where I think how the students have gotten much more active about it than we were before. And I think the fact that we were even able to do the things that we did with the endowment and all that, that, that was student wind in our sails, just pushing us forward and helping us. So I think that is really um, a critical part of what matters is trying to do it, but you can't do any of these things if you don't understand how humans, the human connection to it. You know, if it's it's really dispassionate, it won't really take you any place. The other um, part of things that matter to me, I want to go a little bit into the creativity and this discovery. When I was um, working at Dartmouth, I got this amazing grant. I got a million dollars which was a lot of money at the time, to run a program for kids in fourth grade about science. Now, it's interesting. Of course, I had one of the kids in fourth grade. Virtually everything I did kind of grew up with my kids. I did kindergarten programs and one-year-old, you know, moved on. But that was when one of my kids was in fourth grade, and I was working with a teacher, and we were thinking, what can we do that takes science away from something that makes people like they're in or out. You can do math or you can't. You can do science isn't for me. All that kind of stuff because studies had started to show that most kids are immensely curious at a very young age, but it starts getting winnowed out of them really early. Fourth grade turned out to be one of the big grades that starts separating even girls from boys. And you get into middle school then, and it gets really separate. Now, I imagine most of you that wasn't true, and things have probably changed in teaching. But it was really, what was it that was making kids feel that they couldn't be scientists? So we decided to develop a program, and it was going to be run in rural uh, high schools, I mean, elementary schools in Vermont. Vermont and New Hampshire are extremely impoverished rural areas. They don't, they, they're not the rich states they might sound like. They're rich in the cities. They are as poor as can be in the outer lying areas. So we were going to go out into those schools and try to help teachers do something that was much more creative and, and much more um, experimental. I won't go into all the details, but one of the things I studied was fish choice. What do, how do they choose the prey they like? So I was taking fish into these little, these rooms with these kids, and they all had sort of uh, eyedroppers so they could catch the plankton. And they were, I mean, they loved that more than they ever loved the experiment. But I remember talking to them, and this was such an eye opener to me. And, and I said, I asked them, can you help me think of an experiment? Or why would a fish like this type of prey over that type of prey. I was doing the exact same experiment in my advanced animal behavior class at Dartmouth. I kid you not, the exact same experiment, but using different language. The fourth graders were much more creative than the college students. But college students already were getting scared. Like, oh my gosh, do I have the wrong answer? Is this the right place to go? It was, it was such an eye opener to me to remind me that that is in everybody, that creative potential, when they're not fearful about things, how they can just open up and come up with these amazing, sophisticated answers, maybe said in little kid language. And that actually is something I think about all the time. I think about it when I'm in a group of people and they just feel like they won't even think in any kind of open-minded way. I try to go back and remember what's making people close down versus the times in their lives or the, the ways in which they think, in which they still remember they can be open. Um, at convocation, at, at um, commence, no, convocation this year, I talked about the book that was um, written, um, help me for a second. Yo -Yo yeah, Yo-Yo Ma's new book about uh, sort of your, your remaining, your creative childhood. You keep that creative open mind. And that's, that thought, I thought about that all the time. And I think that's another thing that drives me a lot is trying to find ways that you can recapture people's creative mind, their open mind, how they can feel fresh at the start. And how can we use that 
when we look forward, to get rid of these tensions and these polarized ways that we have talking. If we could actually learn something like that by starting fresh every day, thinking about these, these ways that little kids can actually connect that we've lost as we get older, maybe we could actually solve some of those amazing conversational problems that we have that lead to real discontent and, and real problems for people. So, you know, each of those three big categories has led to so many different amazing opportunities for me. You know, as a scientist, I've been able to do research in places that you just cannot imagine, um, from the rainforest in Indonesia, you know, up to the polar regions in Canada, down in Central America, South America. I've been able to work with people from across the world, um, uh, you know, looking at things in their environment. You know, it just has taken me into so many wonderful places, but it keeps reminding me that in the end, we are all the same, too. No matter where I go, who I work with, the kinds of issues we deal with, you know, people are the same, and they carry that. They have inside them, every one of them, that creative kid, that amazing potential for discovery, they have inside every one of them the potential for connection if you start fresh. And we in universities have, without a doubt, the greatest opportunity in any, maybe I would say churches and, and spiritual places have it too, probably hospitals too, places where you get to reach out to people and help them to seek that kind of enlightenment or that opening up of their own capacity. And what a gift it is to be able to be a part of that. So. Those are, you know, sort of a general overview of what really matters to me, and, and I hope why. And I'm hoping we can maybe open it up for conversation or questions. If there, you know, feel free to ask me anything, because um, I'd love to hear, you know, if that made sense to you, or if you understand a little bit about what that that might feel for all of you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, President Full. And. Um, so it's my honor to introduce you to some of our Trojan family here. We've got students in uh, the first couple of rows here, and um, many of them are members of USG's uh, newly established Executive Council on Religious and Spiritual Life at USC, as well as members of our Interfaith Council. And so I'm gonna invite um, Luke Scorsiel up. He's a member of Christian Challenge. And um, let's see, I was trying to remember, oh yeah. And yeah, also a member of the council, so um, he has a question for you. And if you could use the mic. Sure. Thank, you. Thank you for being here. Um, also, shout out to the amazing Annenberg people. Mickey's leaving. Um, yeah, and uh, I really appreciate hearing that, and I've also just thought it's been cool that, I don't know, we're talking about this at a very high level. And uh, I think my question kind of focuses on just, I've, I'm a senior. And having been here for four years, have seen all the things that the university has gone through. Uh, I was in Washington, D.C. when the admission scandal broke, uh, which was big news at that point during my freshman year. Didn't know that there would be bigger news my sophomore year with the pandemic, um, shutting everything down. And you've kind of navigated behind the scenes as we talked about the big list. And I was just curious how your own interaction with faith or spirituality has played out practically um, in the day-to-day -day decisions that you've made over the course of dealing with those pretty big issues. Thank you. I was announced as the new president the day the admission scandal <laughs> broke, too. <laughs> I was being prepped. Like, they might ask you all these questions that, uh-oh, breaking news. <laughs> and, you know, I answered, I was asked that very question. I'm standing in front of all these lights that everyone said. They started listing off scandals and said, why? You know, why'd you take this job? And I actually said I took the job in part because of those scandals. And the reason I said that is that I know, and I think you all do, that at moments of real reflection comes the greatest change. And I was lucky I didn't cause them. You know, it's a lot easier, not that any one person caused them, but I wasn't associated necessarily with the creation, which gave me a position through which to try to find a new way to go forward. They needed to have, I think, a, a bit of an external look, but I saw it as a moment to really fix things. Or not just, uh, you know, I, I like the uh, GSD getting stuff done, uh, sort of feel about that, trying to really make some 
some change, but be able to do it because the people involved themselves were ready for change. So that's how I viewed all these issues that have happened here. And even recent ones, I, I always view them as a chance to learn. I'm back to my dad, doesn't give me the answer, just tries to help me find the process. But my spirituality, it, you know, I think that is part of the, the person I was trying to talk about. I was raised Lutheran, and I was a very devout little kid. You know, I went through every, I loved Oh, I loved my minister. I loved my camp. You know, it was really an important part of me. And, and I don't right now um, have a single church or denomination where I go for worship, but I love to go to many different, den I would go to virtually any denomination and probably find in any service a real moment of peace. But that spirituality, I think, is when you go back to what are the things that guide you the most. And it's the respect of humans you know, that, that respect. So even when you're looking, I mean, those lessons that I learned as a child do unto others, as you, you know, all that stuff I learned as a kid, I think is really important. So even when we think about our scandals and those issues, can we find empathy even in the darkest of the sides? And that is a challenge that we all have to face. I don't think we ever get to true answers if we just simply vilify things. I think we have to find a way to you know, find forgiveness you know, in our souls. So I don't talk about it so much that way. So thank you for asking me. I'm probably a little bit hesitant there as I think it through. But mm -hmm. I think that's what allows you to face it is if you honestly believe that you're working towards a higher place, a better resolution. And that's, you know, that's how I see it. So I think that could be sort of looking as a higher authority or, or human uh, connection create that feeling of spirituality for me. They're really, they're really important. That's what gets you through the worst of it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We've got Stephen Kim up next, member of our Interfaith Council. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Carol Folt. That was such a beautiful message, and thank you for sharing this time and space with us. Um, I kept hearing this idea over and over again of just connection between yourself, the people you love, the people around you, and the natural world we all live in and we all share, and just the discovered and the things we're going to discover and create and just keep building off of. So um, the question I kind of had was, you know, what have you observed as both a leader, just as an individual, um, to be the common characteristics of effective, sustainable relationships um, across all the different communities you've worked with, both big, small, personal, um, larger scale, and across the different goals that you've had to try to accomplish um, in, across those different types of relationships. Such a, it's such a great, really a great question. And the truth is there's many ways people connect. But I do think there are some that are probably more effective. And, and I'd start um, by saying that listening, I mean, that's kind of, people will all say that, but there's lots of different kinds of listening. If you're listening, but you're also trying to walk in their shoes, no matter how hard that is, that I think is a really powerful way of listening. So that you're not listening in order to correct it, or to fix it, or to re you know get rid of the word but, or all those sorts of things, but you're in, sta in fact, at that moment of listening, you're truly trying to be looking out of their eyes. That is a really special thing. I don't know that anyone can do it all the time. Um, I've seen, pe I see Varun do it. I see other people here do that. And when that happens and people see it, see it that is an immediate first connection. So I think that's one. I mean, I think joy and humor are enormously important. To connect. I mean, I like to laugh. I mean, my office with Reen, we're laughing all the time. And if you're not laughing, I, I think it's hard. And so finding ways to, as students or as staff members or faculty, to connect through humor or through sheer, you know, quirkiness. I mean, we all live in the same, we're all on, on USC campus. There's, even if we're an opposition, there are so many things that we're all sharing. And so I think finding those common experiences for some people, of course, it's through your children, through other, it's through music, it could be through food, a great connector, but finding those points of leverage and connection, even before you worry about the points of difference, seem to be 
to be really an exciting and very effective tool. And I think the, the third one I'd say is that if you can embrace difference as the best fuel for connection as opposed to the thing you're trying to get over, mm -hmm. but it's the thing you're trying to embrace, mm -hmm. it's a really big difference. And I, I'm going to give you guys, especially, I mean, sort of a very, this is a very scientist kind of uh, perspective for, that I have. So I've been out studying populations in the wild a million times. And I used to think the world came down to two people, two kinds of people in my sort of field. Ones that want to know the mean, you know, what is the average. And then the people that could care less what the average is, they want to know the variance. What is the I am clearly a variance person. <laughs> but it's been really a good thing for me. In fact, I've written many papers all about variance. It's probably partly why I got the job. It was really helping me look forward. You think about climate change. It's not about the average temperature. It's about all that. You know, that mean has something to do with life, but it's embracing the fact that things are different, not that we're looking for a single thing we agree on, but we're trying to encompass all the things we believe. That is huge. So people that do that really well, I, I think, help make that connection. Definitely. And do you have anything to say more on like the sustainability parts of those relationships, like keeping those moving forward? And well, you know, strong? I think they are sustained by the, by the truth of them. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you truly are walking in people's shoes, you don't go back. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I mean, I actually think these are sort of one directional. If you've opened that door and gone through, you're not going to go backwards, and that's why it sustains. Mm -hmm. And you probably have this yourself. I bet a lot of you have friends who are politically extremely different from you. But there was one point in your relationship where it could have gone a different way. And is it because you made that first step and realized that's OK? That's not the thing that is going to define my relationship. It didn't go back. If you've decided that together you're going to solve a problem, that's a huge positive that, that doesn't really go backwards. And if joy and laughter and those shared things are the things you really like, you can always return to them when things get bad, you know, so they can help sustain it. So I think that's partly why, is that if they're real, and you reinforce them. I mean, you do have to reinforce it. One time doesn't do it, but you reinforce it. it they don't, I don't think they go away. I yeah. love that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
very, very hard time. But in the end, I had the legal authority. I got the attorney general from the state to write a letter saying I could do it. Um, and I was able to do it. So the night that we actually removed the final, that pedestal, you know, I was standing outside at 3 in the morning watching it happen. And I, was, I had tears in my eyes, of course. But not for myself, but for what it would mean that next year, no student on that campus would have ever even seen it. All the new, it would have been utterly gone. And that's what it felt like. Again, hard for me. I had to give up a lot to do it. It was worth every minute and never once regretted it. Never once regretted it. But I was sad because I knew I was going to leave things that I loved there. But within two weeks, they had replanted the grass. And I was standing close by, and two people were talking at that spot. And they were crying and saying their kids would never have to see that monument. So for me, there was nothing that could have ever felt better than to know that. And now I talk to my friends back there. And for most new students, it's, they all know about it. But where was that? What was that? So it did tell me that you could actually make changes that have a lasting positive impact. And, uh, Again, what a gift to be the person, the only person that could do it. So if I didn't do it, that would have been, I would have regretted it my entire life. I, I would have regretted it my entire life. So I felt that way about it. Yeah. Well, we're about at time. So I want to thank you so very much, President Fall, on behalf of the Office of Religious and Spiritual Life, on behalf of the Interfaith Council, um, as well as um, the Levin Institute for Humanities at Dornsife, all our co-sponsors, and uh, really many thanks for your leadership and for being with all of us today. Let's hear it for President Fall. Thank you. It's wonderful. It's wonderful that you're coming to have these kinds of conversations and thinking about statues and things like that. We did change BKC. And as you heard, th when you learn more about Dr. Joseph Medicine Crow, you will be so proud every single time you walk in that building. And so things like that matter. And I think, you know, it's just, again, a great chance to be around and to have our our whole community discover this extraordinary man and his entire community is going to be really fun for